This fight scene has been requested many, many times. She knew you'd come. For fans of The Witcher, you already know what's coming. YouTube, please note. I have taken extra care to contextualize any and all violence within a lesson of human anatomy, as well as omitted the most gruesome aspects of this fictional encounter. I do not use any clips for shock value, and I don't condone the use of violence to solve problems. After all, surgeons must take the Hippocratic Oath. Where's Renfrey? She's at the tower with your little friend, Marelka. Unfortunately for Renfrey's men, they do not share my concern for decorum. She gave us a message to pass on to you. You have to choose the lesser evil. It's an ultimatum. Get it? With that being said, I'd like to invite Associate Professor Geralt to the front of the class as we are about to begin our lesson. And he is about to earn his nickname, the Butcher of Blaviken. You'll notice he's using a fairly short longsword, which he wields with as much precision as my most skilled colleagues do the scalpel. And no matter how precisely his opponents wield their weapon of choice, they prove little more than a nuisance to his combat prowess. Now, before we examine our first patient, be warned, this strike is not for the faint of heart. Whoa, 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 professor. I'll have you stop right there. A surgical demonstration of penetrating trauma to the oral cavity. Geralt's sword completely passes through the mouth and upper portion of the cervical spine behind it. The width of the sword, while parallel to the ground, practically guarantees a severed spinal cord at approximately the C2 level right beneath the brainstem. Thankfully, this type of maneuver is performed with helpful props. I'm blocking this stunt performer's sword blow with nothing. We often use cut-off swords for particularly complex technical pieces. And for good reason. It is possible to survive a severed spinal cord injury, but not at this level. Effectively, when the spinal cord is severed, communication between the brain and the body below the injury stops and all sensory, motor, and autonomic function below that point ceases. Given that the phrenic nerves, which coordinate breathing activity by contracting the diaphragm, originate at the third, fourth, and fifth cervical spinal levels, which is below the level of our attack, our first patient will soon suffocate, or rather, would have suffocated had Geralt not twisted and pushed his sword up and through his opponent's face. Here is his finishing position from Netflix behind the scene featurette with the interim tissue rip and explosion edited out. This sword is actually half length. With the half length, it allows for a lot more moves to be done, which involve blood and gore. The difficulty is we all have to perform like the sword is full length rather than half length. As I explain, let your imagination fill in the blanks. By pressing the tip of his sword against the back of his victim, Geralt gains enough leverage to move the blade up and along the patient's jawline in a maneuver that would detach the mandible from the skull at the temple mandibular joint and sever any tissues, nerves, and blood vessels from the middle of the neck outwards. There is no doubt that he will have bled out by the time Geralt has finished with the rest of his crew. Our next two challengers fare much better than the first. Though that really isn't saying much. At first, I thought we were looking at a transverse, meaning a cross, laceration to the lower abdomen as the attacker keels over in pain. But upon closer inspection, it appears that Geralt connected with the posterior aspect of his elbow, a far more favorable spot to receive a crossing slash as the abdomen contains many vital organs and lacerations there can easily lead to blood loss and infection. Theoretically, due to the trajectory of the blade, one could easily sustain damage to the structures around the lateral aspect of the elbow, including the muscles of the posterior compartment of the forearm, of which there are 12, the ligaments stabilizing the elbow joint itself, the radial head or neck, or the lateral humeral epicondyle, or even the neurovascular structures crossing the elbow joint. And as such, this fighter is lucky to retain function in his arm. Or unlucky since he once again must face Geralt. Pro tip, 
When the Witcher administers a survivable blow, put on your acting hat and play dead. The first laceration across the cheek, though painful, avoids major blood vessels and would only require a thorough cleaning and some stitches. It looks to extend from the tragus of the ear to the corner of the mouth, approximately four or so inches. Typically, it takes about four to five stitches per inch to sufficiently close a wound of this length and depth. But Geralt drags his sword upwards in an arcing motion that we can only assume to have some grave consequences. A horizontal slash across the neck and throat could easily sever the jugular vein, which resides just under the surface of the tissue, causing severe blood loss and then death. If the cut is deep enough, it could also cut the trachea and ligaments that control movement of the head, as well as the carotid artery, which is embedded deeper in the tissues of the neck. In all likelihood, this is another patient lost to exsanguination, or in other words, a whole lot of bleeding. Penetrating trauma to the interior aspect of the lower thigh at or around the level of the knee. They've done an excellent job coordinating the movie magic here. If you can see in this particular freeze frame, if that stuntman doesn't move in the perfect way, the operator gets a wooden pole in the eye. Much better than a sword tip in the knee joint. I say this because upon contact, the momentum of the sword stops sharply and Geralt's hand rebounds or recoils as though the tip of the blade is lodged in something dense. You see the crack right there? It's already cracking by the sword. A combination of bone and ligament could cause this type of rebound. Within the knee, there there are four major ligaments. The anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, in the center of the knee. The posterior cruciate ligament, or PCL, in the back of the knee. The medial collateral ligament, or MCL, which gives stability to the inner knee. And the lateral collateral ligament, or LCL, which gives stability to the outer knee. A ligament's job is to connect bones to each other to offer strength and stability to the joint where bones meet. In this case, the femur, or the thigh bone, and the shin bone, or the tibia. Judging by the angle of the attack, the MCL towards the interior of the knee is most at risk here. If Geralt penetrated the actual joint capsule via the fleshy space adjacent to the kneecap, the meniscus and the ACL would also be at risk. MCL tears have favorable non-operative recovery possibilities, depending of course upon the severity. Whereas unstable meniscus injuries and a ruptured or transected ACL is usually treated surgically. If instead the point of the sword became lodged in the vastus medialis, a teardrop shaped muscle and one of the four that make up the quadricep, it could penetrate all the way to the bone without causing a more substantial flesh wound. In my opinion, this attacker is the smartest of the bunch as he stays down. He doesn't sustain any fatal injuries and unless any off-screen shenanigans occurred later on, he would survive. That is, of course, unless the tip of the sword managed to clip the femoral artery as it passes through the adductor hiatus. Then that would be a problem, a real problem. On second thought, I may have to revise my fatality assessment for this attacker. Wow, professor, you're moving very quickly, but I'm sure the interns are up for a challenge. Now suddenly dual wielding the sword of his fallen attacker and his own, Geralt spins deftly about just as he does in the video games, leaving airborne limbs flying in his wake. Excellent adaptation. This is another patient who stays down and thus will hopefully have an opportunity to receive medical attention. It may be wishful thinking, but if he can covertly collect his severed hand and sneak quickly to a nearby emergency room, there is still hope for his hand. An article in the Journal of Plastic Reconstructive Surgery tells us, replantation is the reattachment of a severed body part with attempts to restore neurovascular and musculoskeletal integrity, function, and aesthetics. On September 7th, 1964, the first extremity replantation, a completely amputated hand, by vascular anastomosis technique was successfully performed. And we've come a long way since then. Gabriel Granados has arrived for a checkup and therapy session. The focus is on the arms, but not the ones he was born with. Hmm. I knew something looked a little, um, different. Incredibly, those aren't even his original arms. And yet, 
the muscles, nerves, and tissues are working in tandem to restore some level of function. Gabrielle has become the first person in Latin America to have a double arm transplant. The 17-hour operation is far from the most grueling part of this story. When a patient presents with a severed limb in adequate condition to perform a replantation procedure, there is a lot to accomplish, but Matthew Harb, MD, here on YouTube, sums it all up quite nicely. First, you fix the bone with a K-wire. The next step is to repair the extensor tendon. After that, you'll repair the artery and vein, followed by the flexor tendon. Next, you'll repair nerve and skin. Though his video focuses on the replantation of a finger, the basic order of steps is similar for a hand. Bone, tendon, blood vessels, nerves, skin. In our case, we have more structures to contend with, including the musculature of the forearm. Did you know that the muscles that control our digits reside mainly in the hand? In a weird sort of way, that's kind of like using the actual word that you are defining in the definition of the word. But I digress. Our patient had the hand severed above the wrist. First, damaged tissue will be removed. Then we will reattach the radius and ulna with surgical plates and screws. And that, of course, is presuming that the blade was razor sharp and that the cuts through the bone were clean and non-comminuted or fragmented into many pieces without significant bone loss. Then there are the numerous tendons that must be reattached using sutures and suture anchor implants. This alone is a potentially difficult task as tendons have the tendency to bunch up when severed since they are no longer stretching between two points and therefore recoil towards the side that is still fixed to either muscle or bone. Since the tendon's job is to connect muscle to bone, this process is exacerbated by tensing muscle. The portion of the tendons left in the hand will slither further into the hand, and those left in the arm will slither further up into the arm like a recoiling elastic band. Before the surgeon can reconnect severed ends, they must locate them within the patient's tissue, which usually means a bigger incision. Sometimes much bigger. A glimpse into this process and you quickly get an idea of the complexity therein. And we haven't even covered the musculature, blood vessels, nerves, or skin. And quite frankly, with Professor Geralt at the helm, I don't think we'll have time to anyway. It's all done in one take. There was another option which we had, which was a different cut where we shot different angles at different times, and that's slightly easier to shoot. That's part of the reason why I love these action sequences. Blink, and you'll miss it. Run that back, selector. Wheel and come again. At a glance, the penetration here may be sufficient to pass entirely through the body. Depending on where you pause the footage, the wound appears to be dead center or slightly off to the patient's right or our left. If he is extremely lucky, the sword will have missed his heart, which slightly favors the left side in our chest. But that's about where his luck runs out. The blade itself is lodged vertically in the patient's torso, at a depth of about one foot. This necessitates fractured, or maybe more accurately, shattered ribs, or even the sternum. Both of these structures are fixed in place, unable to flex or stretch out of the way for a passing blade. Also, if we compare the angle of the blade upon penetration to the angle of the spaces between the ribs, we see that avoiding them is not possible. There is a chance it has passed through the soft space right below the xiphoid process of the sternum, but no matter the exact angle of penetration, the mediastinum and pleural cavities do not contend well with battle sharpened steel. The mediastinum is the space Space in our chest that holds the heart, great vessels, trachea, and essential nerves. It is one of the three main compartments that make up our thoracic cavity. The other two being your left and right pleural cavities, which hold your left and right lungs respectively. A dangerous game of inches would determine which combination of these cavities the blade had punctured. The lungs, heart, liver, and maybe even the stomach anxiously awaiting the autopsy result. Each of these aforementioned spaces have their own protective membrane that require careful medical attention when punctured, not to mention the organs inside. A punctured lung equals a pneumothorax, when air leaks into the space between your lung and the chest wall, pushing on the outside of your lung to make it collapse, or a hemopneumothorax when the same space fills with blood. 
A punctured heart equals a cardiac tamponade. As the space around your heart fills with the leaking blood or other fluid, putting pressure on your heart, causing it to beat erratically and allowing your cardiac output and blood pressure to drop. A punctured liver may require surgical treatment to either repair the injury or to remove part of the liver, depending on the severity of the injury. I want to thank my fellow surgeons. <laughs> In all of the above cases, blood loss and infection are quite probable, particularly in the world of the continent. Hopefully, whoever attends to our patient first leaves the knife in place until he has been hospitalized. You see, when a blade enters the flesh, it causes damage. But once in place, it also acts a bit like a plug, helping to seal any blood vessels, tissues, and structures that have been punctured. A little sprinkle of magic, followed by an aggressive indication of the carotid arteries and jugular veins. The great vessels of the neck are located here. I'd expect nothing less, Professor. When lives are on the line... There's no time for mistakes. There's no space for mistakes. Even here, this is still a cut-off sword. Because we did this all in one shot, the sword had to be cut off throughout. This cut-off sword prop helps create the illusion of depth in Geralt's strikes. Here, it contributes to the appearance that the sword has passed completely through the neck, which would sever every tissue and structure anterior to the spinal column. The great vessels, as mentioned, as well as the trachea or larynx, sternocleidomastoid, infrahyoid muscles, and various other structures. Suffocation and exsanguination would then race one another to extinguish this attacker's flame, especially after Geralt pulls the blade out. This time, Geralt punctures his attacker underneath the arm conceivably burying his Witcher blade in their flesh all the way up to the hilt. Onlookers with a different vantage point could expect to see the tip of his blade protruding ominously from the victim's back. At this angle, Geralt's blade would have entered and exited the rib cage, wreaking havoc on the organs contained within. As I've already mentioned, there are a lot of goodies in there. Geralt's blade is angled upwards slightly, making short work of the attacker's right lung. The surgeon attending to this case will have his hands full, likely clearing fragments of bone from the pleural cavity, all while having to attend to the inevitable pneumothorax or hemoneumothorax. If no great vessels were severed in the blow, there is a small chance at survival. In a modern medical setting, treatment options may include needle aspiration, chest tube insertion, surgical removal of damaged lung regions known as a lung resection, and the stitching together of lung tissue that is still viable. Supplemental oxygen therapy would also be required to promote lung expansion and support oxygen exchange. Not to mention that with multiple rib segments compromised and the likely flail chest resulting, additional open reduction and internal fixation of one or more ribs might also be required. In this final example, Professor Geralt shows us once again that bones cower before his blade like butter before a hot knife. Here, we can be sure the sternum has been shattered and the blade has penetrated the myocardial tissue of the heart. A 2012 article in Trauma Monthly tells us, there are three primary physiological disturbances associated with cardiac trauma. Hemorrhage, pericardial tamponade, and cardiac failure. Hemorrhage, or an escape of blood from a ruptured blood vessel, especially when profuse, will be present to some degree in each of these possibilities, most commonly in association to penetrating wounds, such as exsanguinating hemorrhage into the thoracic cavity or outside of the cavity. As previously mentioned, we might also expect cardiac tamponade as the space around the heart fills with blood pressing upon it and impairing its function. But that is no way to end a fight. Geralt leaves his target impaled to the wooden door and then... Well again, Professor, I'll have to stop you there in favor of something more suitable to YouTube terms and conditions, bro. Why anyone would challenge a Witcher to one-on-one -on -one combat is beyond me. And in case you were wondering, 
No, you will not survive being beheaded. Not even a little bit. And no, the head cannot be reattached. Whoa. At least not yet. I'll leave you with this excerpt from an incredible 2019 article from Medica, Journal of Clinical Medicine, in regards to the first human head transplantation. Researchers Ren and Canavero have answered to various queries and have expressed their certitude for the feasibility of the procedure. Recently, Ren et al. reported the first cephalosomatic anastomosis has been successfully performed in a human cadaver, confirming the surgical feasibility of the procedure and further validating the surgical plan. The surgical protocol took 18 hours to complete and acted as a full rehearsal, helping in the optimization of surgical steps, in case you were considering having the procedure done yourself. And that was essentially her family, and so she decides to go to town and uh, try and take Geralt out. <laughs> Maybe Renfrey will have better luck than her men. And maybe if you guys like this video, we can return to The Witcher another time. Hats off to Professor Geralt, and remember to follow my online gym, Human 2.0, for free right here on YouTube, where we help you move better and prevent injury. If you enjoyed this lesson by Professor Geralt, then be sure to check out the lessons from Professor Castle and Professor Reacher, and subscribe to the channel. If you didn't, then let me know why in the comment section down below. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.